So a couple of weeks ago, I, I was talking about Le Levites, and I was going back and forth with uh, the firstborn and the Levites. Um, I was talking about why in Numbers chapter 3, um, God is ordering Moses to actually taking the Levites and redeem the firstborn. I was uh, linking this to the other stories in the Bible. So many of the uh, folks on, um, got a little confused because could not really relate to the story that we have learned. Um, I just want to just summarize it before we move on to chapter 4. So when you look at the at the end of uh, Numbers chapter three, uh, starting from verse forty through fifty one, <coughs> God is ordering Moses to count the firstborn. So it says, and the Lord said to Moses, list all the firstborn male of the people of Israel from a month old and upward, taking the number of their names and you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the people of Israel. So Moses listed all the firstborn among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded him, and all the firstborn male according to the number of names and of month old and upward as listed were 22,273. Uh, so the firstborn, when, when Moses accounted the firstborn, anyone above month old and uh, upward, it was accounted as 22,273. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites, instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle, the Levites shall be mine, I am the Lord. And as the uh, redemption price for the 273 of the firstborn of the people of Israel over the above and number of the male Levites, you shall take five shekels per head. You shall take them according to the shekels of the sanctuary, the shekels of the 20 gera and gave the money to Aaron and his sons as the redemption price for those who are over. So Moses took the redemption money from those who were over and above those redeemed by the Levites from the firstborn of the people of Israel. He took the money, 1,365 shekel by the shekel of the sanctuary, and Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. There are a couple things. This is not something that Moses, Moses did things on, in his own. God told Moses to count these people, the firstborn as well as the Levites. So he counted the number of the firstborn, month old and upward. That was a 22,000. And for when they counted for the... Um, the Le uh, Levi Levites was a 22,000, and the firstborn is a 22,273. Uh, so the difference was about 273, right? So for the leftover, which is 273, God ordered the Levites to pay five shekel per head. So they redeem everyone. So I want you to think about, you know, going back to a couple of weeks ago, why God is ordering to redeem the firstborn from Levites. I want you to just kind of like take this story and link it to the story that we already know. So when you think about it, when God ordered Moses to take the Israelites out of Egypt, right? God ordered Moses, I'm going to kill every firstborn in Egypt. So, 
for all the Israelites, I want you to take the firstborn, um, the year old lamb, and slaughter them, and then put the blood over the door frame and stay inside. When the angels, you know, sweep through the uh, the land of Egypt, when the angel sees the blood and it's going to pass over that house, not get killed for the firstborn, but will continue on. But the rest of the firstborn that does not have the blood on the door frame will be killed. So let's go back to uh, Exodus and see what God said. Let's turn to uh, Exodus. We're going to take a look at chapter 13. We're going to read from verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Wherever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and the beast is mine. So the firstborn is mine. Right? And then, I want you to just kill the firstborn, which is the, uh, the lamb, and slaughter them. And when you do this, when you do this, um, we're going to read from verse 11. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and you shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all the first open the womb. All the first born of your animals that are male shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of the donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when it is time to come to your sons, ask you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery first. For when Pharaoh stubborn refused to let us go the Lord kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt the, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb but all the firstborn of my sons I will redeem it shall be as a mark on your hand or uh, frontlets between your eyes for your uh, uh, for by a strong hands and, and Lord brought us out of Egypt so, God is saying, the firstborn is mine, but I'm going to redeem. So for those of people who does not have a blood or, over the door frame, but I'm going to kill them all, right? And then, if, for those of the Israelites, if you actually kill the, uh, uh, the year-old lamb and put the blood over the door frame, I still kill them, but instead of killing your firstborn, for the firstborn... Rather, we're going, I'm going to look at those the, you know, year old the lamb old slaughter to spare the firstborn. Right? So the lamb was a slain for the firstborn, for the Israelites. For those of the people in Egypt who did not slain the, the, the first a year old uh, lamb, obviously they had to pay their own you know, sins. And the firstborn had to die. Right? So it's a very same story we're repeating. Now, firstborn is there, right? But we're going to actually spare, we're going to redeem this firstborn by the Levites. We're going to redeem the firstborn by the Levites. So God is saying, I want you to listen to this. I'm going to spare all this firstborn, and I'm going to take the Levites. 
And whatever it's just, you know, I want you to just like redeem one Levite with one firstborn, one at a time. But their 273 was a short from the Levites. For those of the people, I want you to pay five shekels, which is the shekel is shekel of a century is is basically to spare your life. So five, I mentioned, what is the number five means in the Bible? It's a grace, right? It's a grace. So God is asking, I want you to pay per firstborn, I want you to pay five shekels. So when they actually collected all the money, there was 1,365 shekels and gave it to the Aaron's sons. So he's redeeming the firstborn with the Levites. Exactly same thing what he actually told Moses to redeem the firstborn with the first year old of the land. The same exact story. So he said, now since I redeem, Levites are my firstborn. Now they're mine. The firstborn was mine, but since I redeem with the Levites, you're mine. So from the sons of Jacob, there are three different firstborn. Physically, the firstborn of the Jacob son was who? The firstborn of the Jacob was who? No, Jake, Jacob, Jacob. Not Isaac. Reuben. Reuben, right? But Reuben was a physically firstborn. But what happened to Reuben? He lost his first sonship because you don't know what happened to uh, Reuben? When you go back to uh, Genesis chapter 49, we're going to read from verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruit of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. You went up to my couch. So, he was a physically firstborn, but he was abandoned as a firstborn because he went up to Jacob's couch. So, he was abandoned as a firstborn. So, instead of, instead of, Reuben, someone took the firstborn ship. Who did that? No. Joseph. Joseph. Joseph took the firstborn ship. That's why uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, they took the two uh, double portions because they took the firstborn, um, the, uh, the rights of the firstborn. So Joseph took the firstborn, which is the, uh, the rights of the firstborn, physically. So he became the firstborn. But spiritually, Judah took the firstborn. And as a tribe, out of those 12 tribes, Levites became the firstborn because the firstborn was substituted by the Levites in numbers. So now Levites became the firstborn as a tribe. And coming back to 
chapter 4 from Numbers. So there's a duties of the Levites who are performing certain duties. So there are three different um, the, the clans. There are three clans. Kohathiats and Gershonites and Merarites. So these three clans are taking different um, responsibility. So we're going to take a look at what they do. So let's take a look at for chapter 4. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from the, among the sons of Levi by their clans and their father's house from 30 years old up to 50 years old who all who can come on duty to do the work in the tent of meeting. This is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tent of meeting, the most holy things. When the camp is set out, Aaron and his sons shall go in and take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they shall put it on its a covering of goat skins and spread on top of that a cloth of a, of cloth all of blue and shall put in its poles and over the table of the bread of the, the presence they shall spread the cloth of blue and put on it the plates the dishes for incense the bowls and flagons of the drinks offering and regular show bread also shall be on it then they shall spread over them a cloth of a scarlet and cover the same with the covering of goat skins and shall put it in uh, put in its pole and they shall take a cloth of blue and cover the lamb stem for the light with its lamps its tongs and trays and all the vessels for oils with which it is supplied and they shall put it with all its utensils in a covering of goat skins and put it on the carrying frame and over the golden altar they shall spread the cloth of blue and cover it with the covering of goat skins and shall put in its poles and they shall take all the vessels of the service and uh, that are used in the sanctuary and put them in the cloth of blue and cover them with with the covering of goat skin and put them on the carrying frame and they shall take away uh, ashes from the altar and spread the purple cloth over it, and they shall put it on, uh, put it all the utensils of the altars which are used for the service there, and uh, the fire pans and forks and shovels and the basins, all the utensils of the altar, and they shall spread on it a covering of goat skins and shall put in its pole. And when Aaron and his sons have finished the covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary as the camp sets out after that the sons of Koath shall come to carry these but they must not touch the holy things lest they die these are the things of the tent of meeting that the sons of Koath are to carry and Eleazar the sons of Aaron the priest shall be charge of the oil for the light and the fragrant incense and regular grain offering and anointing oils with the oversight of the whole tabernacle and all that's in it of the sanctuary and its vessels the lord spoke to moses and aaron saying let not the tribe of the clans of the uh that be destroyed among the levites but deal with them a uh, deal through with them that they may live and not die when they come near to the most holy thing Aaron and his son shall go in and appoint them each of his task and to his burden but they shall not go in to look on the holy things even for a moment lest they die so so this Kothites they actually have a certain duties 
So this coauthite actually does a certain things. I just read it. I'm not sure whether you understood what we just read it or just read it but without really understanding what we just read. Um, it's kind of like hard to follow exactly what is going on and what they're doing and it's just kind of a little confusing, all right? I mean, so first of all, who are these people? This three clans we're talking about, Kohat, right? And Gershon and Mara. Who are these people? Do you know who these people are? Yeah. Sons of Levites, that's absolutely correct. So, they are the sons of Levi, which is the son, son of uh, Jacob, right? And then there are four, uh, three sons and one daughter of Levi. So, let's actually go to... Um, let me see if I can find this. All right, let's turn to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 14. These are the heads of their father's house, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. Hanoch, Palu, Hazron, and Carmi, these are the clans of Reuben, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, and Zoar, uh, and Shaul, the sons of a Canaanite woman, these are the clans of Simeon. These are the name of the sons of a Levite according to their generation Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the ears of the life of the Levite being 130, uh, 137 years. So who are these people? They're sons of Levi, right? This Verse 17. The sons of Gershon, Lipni, and Shimei, by their clans. The sons of Kohat, Amram, Izar, Hebron, and Utziel, the, uh, the years of the life of Kohath being 133 years. The sons of Merari, Mahal, uh, Mahili, and Mushi, these are the clans of Levite according to their generations. Amran took as his wife jo Jochebed, his father's sisters. She bore him Aaron and Moses, the year of the life of Amran being 170, 137 years. So who are these people? So where did the uh, Aaron and Moses and Miriam came from? Which line is he actually following? Who are their ancestors of? So who is the father of Aaron and Moses and Miriam? No, 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 no. Yeah, eventually everything goes up to Abraham, but we're talking about 
Moses and Aaron's and Miriam's father, who is who are who is the father of Moses and Aaron and Miriam? You see, we just read together and then <laughs> We're reading, but we're not reading. <laughs> Amram. Right? Amram is the father of Moses and Aaron's and Miriam's. So Amram was married to who? Who? Who is she? His father is his sister. It's kind of weird. It's like an ant. <laughs> his father's sister got married. <laughs> you didn't know this, right? <laughs> this weird structure, right? The thing is, we read the Bible, but we don't really read the Bible. This is the things that we, we find find things out as we just read it carefully. But you know, when we read it, we don't really pay attention to what we're reading. We just say, oh, okay, whatever. Right? It's just next chapter. <laughs> okay, so now you learned three three clans are the sons of Levi. Right? Who are these three? Gershon, Kohath, Merari. Right, and they have one sister. Who are, who's the one sister? Huh? We just read Exodus chapter six. So, starting from verse seventeen, let's read again. The sons of Gershon, Lipni, and Shimei, and by their clans, the sons of Kohath. Amron, Izhar, Hebron, and Utziel, the year of the life of Kohath, being 133 years. The sons of Merari, Mahili, and Mushi, these are the clans of Levite according to their generation. Amron took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the year of the life of Amram being 137 years. So as I mentioned, Amram, which is a son, son of Kohath, right? Jochebed is the sisters of Kohath and got married and they bore a child, which is Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, right? So Kohath and Merari and Gershons are the direct sons of the Levites. Okay? So now going back to numbers, the Kohath is, was what? He was, he was one of the sons of Levi, right? And now, he's ordering Kohath clan, I want you to do this. And the instructions he gave was, the clan of Kohath is the one who is going to carry what's in the holy and holy of a holy place. All the articles within the holy of holy and holy place, they're the one who's responsible to carry. Okay? So we're going to read it carefully this time instead of just, all right, just whatever. I, I don't want you to, I don't want you to say whatever. I want you to just pay a little bit of attention when we read this. Okay? So, going back to chapter 4, verse 4 again. This is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tent of meeting. 
the most holy thing. So they are carrying the most holy things out of all the tabernacle. There are a lot of articles in the tabernacle, but most holy thing, they're, they're responsible to carry this. All right? Verse 5. When the camp is to set out, when, they, when they're moving, Aaron and his son shall go in and take down the veil of the screens and cover the ark of the testimony with it. So they're not. Although the sons of the clan of Koath, because they're not, uh, the, if they're not uh, priests, they're not allowed to go into holy of holy or, or holy place. So only priests could go in and take down. Okay? The verse 6, Then they shall put it, uh, they shall put on its a covering of goat's skin and spread on top of that a cloth of a cloth all of the blue and shall put in it's a pole. So now, first thing, they put what? Yeah. And then? Blue covering. Right? So, they shall put on the covering of a goat skin and spread on top of that cloth of all of blue and shall put in its pole. So which one's on the top? Blue cloth is on the top. So what is this they're actually covering right now? Ark of, yeah, Ark of Testimony. So they're putting the Ark of Testimony, right? They're putting the goat skin first and then put the, the blue cloth over it. Okay, so on top, there is blue on top, correct? Then, verse 7, And over the table of the bread of the presence, what is this? Show bread, correct. They shall spread the cloth of blue. So now they put the blue cloth first, and then put on its plates and dishes for the incense, the bowls and the flagons for the drink offering and regular showbread also shall be on it. Then they shall spread over them a cloth of a scarlet and cover the same with the covering of goat skins and shall put in its pole. Now, what is the first one they put on? First one is blue and second one red scarlet and third goat skins so this is a little bit different than the ark of Co covenant ark of covenant was the first one was the goat skin first and on top of that there is a blue cloth for showbread he puts blue cloth first and then second over it scarlet and third they put the goat skin Okay? Remember that. And then, uh, verse 9, And they shall take a cloth of blue and cover a lamp stamp for the light with its lambs, its tongue, its tray, and all the vessels for oil with which it is supplied. And they shall put it with all its utensils in the covering of goat skins and put it on the carrying frame. So now, for this, uh, the golden lamp stem, he puts what? What's first? Blue cloth first, and then, and goat skins. Blue cloth and gold, the, uh, the goat skin over it. Right? Now, Verse 12, And they shall take all the vessels of the service that are used in the sanctuary and put them in a cloth of blue and cover them with a covering of goat skins and put them on the carrying frame. So they put the blue, right? And then they put all the stuff and then cover with goat skins. And verse 13, And they shall take away the ashes from the altar, 
and spread the purple cloth over it. Which is this? What is this? Correct. Altar of incense. Altar of incense. Right? And they shall put it, put on all the utensils of the altar, which are used for the service there, and the fire pans, the forks, and shovels, and the basins, and all the utensils of the altar, and they shall spread on its covering of goatskins. So what, what did they put first? No, no, first. They use purple cloth and then they put the utensils and then and goat skins so now depending upon which articles within the uh, uh, holy of holy place and the holy place he uses different things now you, you see the what orders and what they put on and what how they are putting it in so let's just summarize it again for the Ark of Covenant what do they put first they put the goat skin first and then put the blue cloth. So on top, people can see the blue cloth for the Ark of Covenant. All right? And then showbread puts what? Blue cloth? No. Scarlet and then goat skin. Goat skins. So three layer, right? Blue, scarlet, and goat skins, right? Okay, what about the lamp stamp? Blue cloth and goat skins. Just two layers, right? Now, the uh, incense altar. It's going to put purple, right? And then goat skins. So you see there's a difference, right? N now the question is, why? Well, God wants to see different ways. It's, it's boring to just to do it all in the same, but like, let's try different things. Is that why? God, God wants some, you know, different style. Is that why? If okay, so let's just summarize it here. I mean, this is first time you're actually reading it clearly and see what they're doing here, right? Which we don't really pay attention for these things. We we'll never do. But we're just paying one by one and see what, what God is actually telling them to do. So, Ark of Covenant, right? Put the goat skin first and then put the blue cloth over it. When you look at it, majority of the stuff that we saw, everything else, actually they put the skin goat on top. So imagine, I want you to think about when they're moving Right? This is actually, they're, they're doing this when, when people are moving. So when the cloud of, the pillar of cloud moves or the pillar of fire moves, this is what they do. Okay? So when they're actually carrying all this stuff, everyone know which one is the Ark of Covenant. Because this is the only articles that has the blue cloth over it. Everything else got, you know, uh, the goat skin over it. But this particular one, the Ark of Covenant, is the only one that has the blue cloth on top. And what does the blue mean? What, actually, we went over this when we were studying the tabernacle back then. So pretty much everything in tabernacle, they use is four colors. Blue, scarlet, purple, and white. All right? Those are the only color that they use. All right? Ark of Covenant has skin goat first and the blue cloth over. So let's think about it for a moment. Tabernacle. 
for the holy place and the holy of the holy place. On the, on the top, what, there are four layers of top. W which one is the first layer of the tabernacle? Excuse me. Hmm? No, not white. Seems like uh, you either forgot everything. <laughs> okay, the first one is covering is the first covering is using four different color. One is blue, scarlet, purple, and white. All right? So going back to Exodus chapter 26. Moreover, you shall make a tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns. That's the first layer of the covering. Okay? And verse 7. You shall also make a curtain of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shall you make. So, the second layer is what? goat's hair and third verse 14 you shall make for the tent covering of tanned rams of skins and the fourth the covering of goat skins on top so there are four layer of covering. The first layer using four colors, which is white, blue, scarlet, purple, where they open it, right? And then they actually uh, make the, uh, what you call the uh, um, chirps over it. And second layer is goat skins goat skin, I mean, not goat hair. And third layer is ram skins dyed with red color. And fourth layer, which on top, was the goat skins. So as I mentioned, when you look from outside, from the tabernacle, right, the fence of the outside of the tabernacle is a five cubits. And the actually the heights of the holy place or the holy of a holy place is 10 cubits. So from outside, you can see the tabernacle because the height of the fence is a lower than the actual tabernacle, uh, the holy place. So from outside of the tent, you can see the holy place from outside. But the covering, which is a completely covering the entire the, uh, tabernacle, is covered with the goat skins. So from outside, you can never see how beautiful it is inside the holy place or the holy of a holy place. Because this is not the place they can get in. Only priests that can get in there. But once they go into the holy place or the holy of holy place, it's a beautiful place. And everything in there is made out of gold. 
nothing but gold. There is no bronze. There's nothing there. It's just all gold, right? Unless you go in there, you won't see the beauty of the holy place or the holy of a holy place from outside. You can never see that. Only high, high priest and the priest could see that. So from outside, the goat skins... Right? This is not actually the goat skin. It's more of, um, um, yeah, sea cow. It's like a sea cow. So when you look at the sea cow, the, the skins of the sea cow, is that really beautiful? It, it's a kind of a gray color, right? And dried. So from outside, it doesn't look good. It's not attractive at all. Right? So, as I mentioned before, when we actually visualize Jesus Christ, what comes to our mind? When we think of Jesus, the image of Jesus, what does it look like in our head? blue eyes <laughs> and blonde right and really handsome looking you know the man right just just by looking at you know that image like someone to adore like look up to like it's a beautiful looking man it's like a image of a, something like uh, Brad Pitt right right that, that's the kind of image that we have in our head because that's what we've been seeing on the you know, paintings or the movies or the image that we have seen. All the image that we have seen was like a beautiful man, beautiful young man with the like, white skins, with the you know, beard and the blonde hairs and you know, handsome looking. You know, Jesus is what we always you know, kind of like saw, right? But according to the scripture, what does it say? What does he look like? So when you go back to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to read from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 For he grew up before him like a young plant like a root out of dry ground he had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him What is it look like is he looking which is, a, which is a completely different than what we've been imagining of Jesus. There's no beauty. There's not, no majesty by looking at him like, oh my God. I mean, there, there's nothing to adore. There's nothing to really desire of this guy. That's how Jesus came as. Nothing like what we saw on the painting or the, what we saw in the movie. So... When we truly actually go up to heaven at some point, we may not even recognize him. Because we're going to look for someone like look like Jesus, but we won't, we won't find him. <laughs> Seriously. So, from outside, just people looking at the, this tabernacle is just covered with the, the uh, sea cow, which is a gray. It doesn't look beautiful at all, which is what she just looked like, right? So, from that, from that 
going back to numbers, the first tabernacle was covered with the goat skins, and, in, and on top of that, there's a blue cloth, which everybody recognized this is the tabernacle. I mean, not tabernacle. This is the, uh, the Ark of Covenant. Everybody sees it. Blue means the sky, right? And then second, second, which is showbread table, right? He puts the blue cloth first, and then second, there's a scarlet. This is a, one of the unique articles. So what does the showbread represent in the tabernacle? It's Jesus. What did Jesus say? I am the bread from heaven. Right? The showbread table represents Jesus. And what does this a scarlet mean? blood it's a blood that's why he put the scarlet for this particular one it put the scarlet in the middle but a cover with goat skin over it so no one can see it but for that particular one it actually has the scarlet cloth in it three layers and then lamp stamp Blue and goat skins. And the last one, which is incense altar. What does this incense altar represent? No. It's us. It's us. The smoke comes up from the incense altar is the one that represents the prayer of the saints so that altar itself is a saint which is a us that's why he's a sit in the middle you know you have to understand from you have to study the tabernacle in order for you to understand if you don't understand the tabernacle you will never going to understand what i'm talking about but ingu you you went over this with me and uh you you would understand i, I don't know is that the uh, it doesn't look like a yonsu it is is bryce i think it's on the call but yeah, the picture is Yansu, but it's not Yansu. But anyway, you went through this uh, tabernacle. I went, you know, I, I went over the details of the tabernacle. So this the the altar of incense in the middle of it that represent represents us, and this has the purple. Why? What does that purple represent? Loyalty, loyalty, royalty is what it, what it shows. He puts that purple on this one. He making us to be royal. That's why he put the pur uh, the uh, the purple cloth for this particular altar of incense, and then we put the goat skin over so no one can see it's the only thing that you can see is Ark of Covenant which represent the father so he only the, the Ark of Covenant has the only cover the cover of blue nothing else so represent this is the father out stands out from everything else so all the attentions goes to where? The Ark of Covenant. Everyone can see it. Nothing can be seen. Right? Everything else is covered with the goat skin, but except the Ark of Covenant. So all the attention gets to the Father. Once again, the Bible is not about us. The Bible is about the Lord. The full attention is not me. Full attention is about the Father. It's the Lord. This is what it's shown in this particular chapter. Why everything else has the, the, the cover with the goat skins, but why the Ark of Covenant is covered with the blue? Why the, 
the uh, showbread has the scarlet clothed in the middle. Why the, the incense altar has a scar, um, the purple clothed and why the others has a blue. This is what God told Moses to do so. It is not designs of Moses. It's not something that he wanted to do it. This is what God told him. This is what you should do when you carry. And then verse 21 The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take a census of the sons of Gershon, also by their father's house and by their clans. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, you shall list them, all who can come to do duty, to do service in the tent of meeting. This is the service of the clans of the Gershonite in serving and Bearing burdens, they shall carry the curtains of the tabernacles and the tent of meetings with its covering and the covering of goatskin that is on top of it and the screen for the entrance of the tent of meeting and the hanging of the cord and screens for the entrance of the gates of the court that is around the tabernacle and the altar and their cords all the equipment for their service and they shall do all that needs to be done with regard to them. All the service of the sons of the Gershonite shall be at the command of Aaron and his sons in all all that they are to carry and in all that they have to do. And you shall assign to their charge all that they are to carry. This is the service of the clans of the sons of Gershonite in the tent of meeting, and their guard duty is to be under the directions of Itamar, the sons of Aaron, the priest. And for the sons of Merari, you shall list them by their clans and their father's house from 30 years old up to 50 years old, and you shall list them, and everyone who can come on duty to do the service of the tent of meeting, and this is what they are charged to carry as the whole of their service in the tent of meeting, the frames of tabernacles with its bars and pillars and base, the pillars around the cord with their bases, peg and cords with all their equipment and all their accessories, and you shall list by name the object that they are required to carry. This is the service of the clans of the sons of Merari, the whole of their service in the tent of meeting under the direction of Itamar, the sons of Aaron, the priest. And Moses and Aaron and the chief of the congregation listed the sons of Kohathites by their clans and their father's house from 30 years up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for a service in the tent of meeting. And those listed by clan were 2,750 this was the list of the clans of the Kohathite, all who serve, served in the tent of meeting, whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord by Moses. Those listed of the sons of Garshon by their clans and their father's house, from 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for a service in the tent of meeting. Those listed by their clans and their father's house were 2,630. This was the list of the clans of the sons of Gershon. All who served in the tent of meeting, whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord. Those listed of the clans of the sons of Merari by their clans and, and their father's house. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for service in the tent of meeting. Those listed by clans were 3,200. This was the list of the clans of the sons of Merari from uh, whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord by Moses. All those who were listed of the Levites of whom Moses and Aaron and the chiefs of Israel listed by their clans and their father's house from 30 years old up to 50 years old Everyone who could come to do the service of ministry and service of bearing burden in the tent of meeting. 
Those who listed were 8,580. According to the commitment of the Lord through Moses, they were listed, each one with his task of serve, serving or caring, though they were listed by them as the Lord commanded Moses. So from here, just kept saying, everything was a commanded by the Lord to Moses. He did exactly what he was told to do. Not by his own will, but what God told him to do. It's not something that Moses designed or Aaron designed. This is something that God told Moses, I want you to do this. I want you to pick these people. I want you to do, have them do this work. And I want you to do this, or do this, and do that. He gives the full instructions what to do. So it's not by their design. Chapter 5, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has discharged and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so, and put them outside the camp, as the Lord says, said to Moses, so the people of Israel did. So God is ordering the, the people who are unpure, separate them, and put them outside the camp. Right? So what does that tell us? The people who are unclean, cannot stay in the camp, cannot stay with the Lord. They have to be separated. They have to be driven out of the camp. When they're, def when they're purified, as we have learned in the Le uh, Leviticus, and then when they cleanse, they can come back to the, the camp. Lepers cannot come back to the camp unless they are verified and checked by the priest. And for those of the people who touch the uh, dead ones, they have to stay outside the camp for seven days before they're purified, and then they can come back to the camp. So what does that tell us? Anyone who are not cleansed, anyone who is not purified, will be driven out. does not matter who they are, they will be driven out. They cannot stay with the Lord. Meaning, Sinned people, unpurified with the sins, will never stay with the Lord. This is why, this is why we all have to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. If not, everyone will be driven out, regardless of who they are. It doesn't matter. Even the king has to be driven out. Priest has to be driven out. Anyone who has that will be driven out, regardless of their positions, their titles, their statue. Whatever it may be, it doesn't really matter. It's not what position you hold, what honor, how much money you have. It doesn't really matter. You have defiled, you'll be driven out. So God is clearly telling us who can stay with the Lord, who cannot stay with the Lord. So then, verse 5, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel when a man or woman commits any of the sins that people commit by breaking faith with the Lord and person realizes his guilt he shall confess his sins and he has committed and he shall make full restitutions for his wrong adding a fifth to it and giving it to him to whom did not uh, who did the wrong but if the man has no n next to kin to whom restitution by made for the wrong the restitution for Wrong shall go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of atonement, which, with which atonement is made for him. And every contributions, all the holy donations of the people of Israel, which they bring to the priest, shall be his. Each one shall keep his holy donations. Whatever anyone gives to the priest shall be his. So if some, someone who has a sin and realizes guilt... What does he do? Verse 7, He shall confess his sins that he has committed. So you have to confess first. And he shall make full rest, uh, 
restitutions for his wrong, adding a fifth to it and giving it to him to whom he did the wrong. So they have to pay back with how many times? It says, give, uh, adding a fifth to it. Adding a fifth to it. So going back, you keep hearing this five throughout the Bible. Verse 11, test for adultery. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, if any man's wife goes astray and breaks faith with them, if a man lies with her sexually, and it's a hidden from the eyes of her husband, and she is un undetected through the she has defiled herself, and there is no witness against her. Um... Since she was not taken in the act. And if the spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife, though she has not defiled herself, then men shall bring his wife to the priest and bring the offering required of her, the tenth of an epa, of barley flour. He shall pour no oil on it and put on frank, uh, frankincense on it, for it is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of remembrance, bringing iniquity of remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an uh, earthenware vessel and take some of the dust that is on the fl uh, floor of the tabernacle and put it into a water and the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and unbind the hair of a woman's head and place in her hands and grain offering of remembrance which is the grain offering of jealousy and in his hands the priest shall have the water of a bitterness that brings the curse then the priest shall make her take an oath saying if no man has lain with you and if you have if you have not turned aside to uncleanness while you are under your husband's authority be free from this water of bitterness that brings the curse but if you have gone astray though you are under your husband's authority and if you have defiled yourself and some man other than your husband has a lane with you then let the priest to make the woman take the oath of the cursed and says to the woman the lord to make you a cursed and oath uh, among yours um, people when the lord makes your thigh falls away and your body swells may this water that brings the curse to pass into your bowels and make your womb swell and the thigh fall away and woman shall say amen amen then the priest shall write this curse in a book and wash them off into the water of bitterness and shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings the curse and the, uh, and the water that brings the curse shall enter into, into her and cause a bitter pain. And the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy out of the woman's hands and shall wave the grain offering before the Lord and brings it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the grain offering as his uh, memor uh, memorial portions, the burning it on the altar, and afterward shall make a woman drink the water. And when he has made her drink the water then if she has defiled herself and has broken fate with her husband the water that brings the curse shall enter into her and cause bitter pain her womb shall swell and her thigh shall fall away and the woman shall become accursed among her people but if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean then she shall be free and shall conceive children this is the law in case of jealousy when a wife though under her husband's authority goes ashtray and defile herself or when the spirit of jealousy comes over a man and he is jealous of his wife then he shall set the woman before the lord and the priest shall carry out her all this law 
The man shall be free from iniquity, but the woman shall bear her iniquities. What a weird law. All right. What, what is this? I mean, while I was reading this, and I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Out of my own um, understanding, okay? Who commits adultery more, man or woman, in a marriage? In real world. Of course, the woman commits adultery as well. Of course, the man can ha commit adultery without woman, right? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> right? <laughs> but in marriage, most of adultery, or when you look at the portions of it, usually the man supersedes the woman. It's adultery. Typically, in real life scenario. Of course, there are women who commit adultery, but you know, when you look at the number of adulteries that commits in a man versus woman, usually the man's, the number of man's adultery outnumbers the woman's adultery. All right? Then, when I look at this God's law, there's no mention of a man's committing adultery. It's the only law against a woman. What about man? Do you think it was a different in all days that women actually committed more adultery than men in back, you know, in this time? All right, when you think about it, right? Men are the same from all days and today is not much different. Then why did God only give this law to women? To me, it's it's unfair. Right? God should actually give more restrictive law or regulations to the man rather than women. Or apply this to anyone, whether it's a, a husband or a wife, it equally applied. So then we may say, well, you know what? There is no equality in the Bible. Right? Who says equality? It's just totally against uh, the understanding that we have. Why only God mentioned about the wife actually committing adultery rather than no mention of adultery of the man? So, I'm going to just connect the story. I'm going to connect this story to the story that we know very well in New Testament. Let's take a look at um, let's turn to yeah let's take a look at John chapter 8 which is the very well-known story John chapter 8 we're going to read together they went each to his own house but Jesus went to the Mount of Olive early in the morning he came again to the temple all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them the scribe and the Pharisee brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman 
has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So, what do we, uh, what do you, us to uh, such, uh, us to stone such woman? So what do you say? This they said to test them that they might have some charge to bring against them. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. At once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the older older ones and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him Jesus stood up and said to her woman where are they has no one condemned you she said no one Lord and Jesus said neither do I condemn you go and from now on sin no more once again this story we know very well right now, see if you can actually connect the story that we just read versus this. Okay, so once again, what is this a story about? Hmm? There's a, the woman who committed adultery and caught in the middle of the adultery, right? My question is this. You know, I, I just, we talked about this numerous times in the past, but if she was caught in the middle of adultery, obviously there must be a man who is committing the adultery with her, right? There must be a man. It would it just, she cannot commit adultery by herself. That doesn't make any sense. There has to be a man somewhere, right? So what happened to that man? If she was caught in the middle of it, the man should be there. But how come that man was not dragged out? Why only woman was dragged out? And then when she was brought out, do you think they waited until she put on the nice clothes and, you know, it's like, oh, hold on a second, let me just uh, touch my hairs before i uh, being dragged out. Or she would have been like dragged out like without really properly just dressing up. She was literally dragged out. And she committed adultery and she must be stoned. If she has to be stoned. And then the scribers was asking them, according to Moses' law, the woman who commits adultery stoned her. That's the law. God told us to do so. So what do you say? Should we stone her? What should we do? So they are testing Jesus, what he has to say. And Jesus said, well, anyone who without sins throw a stone at her. And everyone is, was astonished because they were expecting Jesus's stumble and then say either if he said stone her then oh you have no mercy and if if Jesus tells her don't just spare her then you said you're against the law so there is a perfect trap for Jesus but the answer that Jesus gave was without flaw And going back, what happened to the man? 
and why only women was dragged out. So, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 2. Now, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an inter intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sins, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned under the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. What is he saying? What is he saying? What does the law do? And then law brings to where? Law brings to the Christ. Because of a law, she was brought out. Right? Because of the law, because God gave the law to Moses, and if anyone who commits adultery stoned that woman, by law, she was dragged out. But when she was dragged out, right? She was dragged out to Christ, which is Jesus. And when she was dragged out to Jesus, she was about to die. She was about to be stoned by all these people. But because she was brought out to Jesus, and she spared her life. If she was not brought out to Jesus, she would have been stoned and be killed. But because she was brought out to Jesus, she was able to spare her life. As I mentioned, in the Old Testament, woman represent what? Israel. In New Testament, what does woman represent? Church. It's not about one particular woman, adulterous woman, is not what we're referencing. So then, why was this the law was only given to women? Because it was representing Israel, because he is representing the church. With our husband, right? Who's the husband of the church? Jesus is the husband of the church, right? So then, would Jesus would commit adultery? No. This is why the law was not given for man. Because the husband represents Jesus. He will never commit adultery. Only woman who commits adultery 
It is us. It is Israel. It's a church. Is the one who commits adultery. The law was only given to women, not to men. So because of the law, they have to be brought out. And if they actually committed adultery, they will be cursed. If they did not, they will be spared. Okay. We have to uh, cover chapter 6, but I don't think we'll be able to actually cover chapter 6 with the amount of time that we have left. So let's just um, stop here.